You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. Thanks for tuning in to Mining Stock Education. I'm your host, Bill Powers, and joining me today for the quarterly check-in is Joe Mazumdar of ExplorationInsights.com. He's worked in all aspects of uh, the mining sector and is now the newsletter writer, editor over at ExplorationInsights.com. Highly respected letter. If you don't know about it, there's a link to it in the show notes. Joe, thanks for coming on the show again today. And as investor sentiment, particularly in the junior gold mining sector, is at a low, Share with us how you deal with it and how do you look at the equities in your account now when they're a little more depressed? Are you tempted to sell or do you only sell based on fundamentals? Uh, thanks again, Bill. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I would say um, if I'm going to sell, uh, it would be basically because the drill results or something that the company is doing does not hang with, with my original investment thesis. And so if that's the case, and I don't see any turnaround and I'd have sold companies that I think uh, have been underperforming and I don't know if they're going to turn around. Uh, but I've held on to others that uh, have underperformed to date, but I'm still expecting drill results. And I still think the assets are, are, are quality and I still think the people are good. So I'll, I'll keep hold of those. But yes, uh, when some companies are going down, but um, and uh, and it's mostly because of, of some changes that they they're making or results that impact my investment thesis. That that would be the main reason to sell. What about when uh, you have a little junior explorer and the treasury is getting kind of low, sentiment is low, would you be more tempted to sell just because they're going to be raising again and sentiment so low? Yeah, I mean, there there is that. I mean, I'm, I'm not a trader uh, and, and, and always looking for that. But I, I do note that, OK, if the company is depressed and maybe this is a good re-entry point and, you know, I would back off just like most of the market thinking, OK, they're going to come to the market anyway. I'll just wait for that. The last thing you want to do is buy in the market and then the next day have them announce the financing at a, at a discount to what you just bought at and they were offering the warrant. But again, you know, financings are nice. And, you know, if you get a warrant and if you are on the ASX, you're not going to get a warrant. What I like about financing is, is it locks in a price because of these illiquid uh, companies. It's hard to get that volume of shares sometimes. But saying that, you know, given the volatility, the market drill results and that, you know, you would like to sell when you can, but you're sort of locked for four months. And so there is a value in not having that inflexibility for four months as well. So I wouldn't say that all financings are always better than just buying on the market. There were two recent, uh, this week, a CapEx deals announced, one with Marathon Gold and one with Rio2 CapEx to bring these mines into production. If you could, could you walk us through your analysis first of the Marathon Gold deal? Do you like this? Is this a good move on behalf of the management of Marathon Gold? Okay, so in terms of background, maybe what we should do is just say, you know, what it, does a typical financing look like? Like what would be, uh, you know, the goal of any company with respect to how to fund their project? And, you know, if we look at a weighted average cost of capital, you know, equity is more expensive than debt. So you'd want to do something like more debt. 70, maybe 70%, and then maybe 30% equity. So with no hedging on the debt facility, if you can avoid it. So, I mean, that would be sort of like, okay, this would be my goal. And at, no convertibility good, on the debt also? Okay. Yeah, and then no, no, no high rate, that sort of thing, as fixed as you can get it long term, and then with no uh, recourse if you pay it back quicker, something like that. You know, that would be your ideal. Okay, so if we look that, keep that in your head. Okay, and if we look at Marathon Gold, which is uh, developing the Valentine Lake project uh, that they've got a feasibility study on, and it's a big open pit. Uh, it's, uh, you know, 1.3, 1.35 grams per ton. Uh, great recovery, 94%. And uh, the strip ratio is kind of high. It's like seven to one. You know, so that's kind of a high, very high strip ratio in terms of uh, an open pit. But but and they have a decent market cap. They're like at seven hundred million dollars Canadian, and they want to raise uh, three hundred and five million Canadian. So that's perfectly reasonable in terms of your market cap to your what you need in terms of capital. Uh, and in U.S. terms, it's about two hundred and thirty million. So they already had 
uh, already have like about 84 million U.S. in cash. So out of that 300 uh, million U.S. that they need, they've already got 84 million, which is a decent chunk of change. So that's about 30 to 35 percent of what they need. So anybody coming in to lend the money would look at it. OK, they've got equity already. So, you know, that makes it easier for me. Then it's all about due diligence on the project and that uh, and to find out what interest rate and blah, blah, blah. Sprott lending is usually, you know, in my regard, in terms of lenders, is usually the lender of last resort because they tend to have higher rates than most people. And this is a credit facility, not a project debt facility. So it introduces a little bit more flexibility that might come at a higher cost. So if we take an example, Novo, the Australian uh, um, uh, development of uh, uh, the Placer Gold, uh, uh, sorry, Paleo Placer Gold project in, in in Western Australia in April 2021, they did a Sprott credit facility for US 60 million. Uh, this granted is much more, this is 185 million, but that one was basically three month LIBOR plus 8% at a minimum of 1%. So it's like 9% cost of capital. So keep that in mind in terms of, uh, you know, when when we look at equities and uh, equity analysts look at equities, and I was one of them, you know, we tend to use 5% discount rate to, you know, the, to, to account for the risk of the asset and discount it back to today. I mean, but the debt part of this, they're telling you it's it's 9%. You know, uh, so it's 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 common. So the, you know, there's a big risk exposure, and so what is that risk involved? You know, the volatility of the gold price, but potentially if this is Newfoundland, maybe a bit more infrastructurally challenged. Is the capital going to be that amount? You know, does uh, does the resource hold together? Uh, you know, and uh, so there's still a lot of due diligence to do, final budget, and getting the permits before they can actually access the credit facility. But it's probably, this one is probably closer to, you know, your ideal facility, except potentially for the lender. Uh, and with the lender's background, you sort of figure it's going to be a higher cost of capital uh, for Marathon. And the second one is the Rio 2. Could you walk us through your analysis of the Rio 2 CapEx deal? So Rio, their market cap's much lower. They're like 150 million, and they need, I believe, it's uh, they're looking at 125 million in terms of U.S. Um, so the 148 million, sorry, is is Canadian. So maybe that's uh, whatever 110, 120, whatever U.S. And so their ratio of value, market value to to what they need is is a little bit more tilted. Um, so they need 125 million. And so this is a bit of a different project. It's open pit, but it's a little bit more remote. So we're talking diesel generated power. We're talking over 3000 meters above sea level, which is not ridiculous, uh, especially in this part of Chile. And this is where we are at. So we went from Newfoundland, low risk geopolitical risk jurisdiction to Chile, which is considered one of the better jurisdictions in South America. But I put a little caveat around that because uh, as your subscribers or your viewers may or may not know, they're going through election this year. And so they're talking about increasing taxes and royalties. And they have you know, several center and right wing candidates that if any of them get elected, nothing changes, really. And then they got two left of center candidates and one more left than the other. It's really that one candidate, uh, I forget his name right now, if he gets into the first round of the presidential elections, then the risk goes up. So I'm not sure right now the feasibility study at Rio was done under whatever assumptions back in 2019. I don't know if there's any you know, uh, discussion about, you know, what are the, what is, what happens with the taxes or royalties changes? I mean, granted that Rio feasibility study uh, or PFS that was done before was done at a much lower gold price, I believe 1300 compared to where the gold price sits now. So there will be advantages on that side. But what they've tried to do is skinny the capital, you know, by, by uh, changing it from a single stage crush open pit heap leach to a run of mine where you don't have to crush it. So that that helps with the operating costs and also helps with the capital costs, if it works, because they did the PFS assuming a single stage crush. 
Now they're bringing in a run of mine idea. So if you take that, it you know um, you know the idea was 70 30 debt equity. Most CEOs would not rank getting a stream on the main product as their first choice of how to fund a project. So, so that would be my issue here would be the fact that 50 million of or 40% of the 125 million is actually a stream. This is not a stream that impacts wheat and precious metals very much. It, you know, they're a multi-billion dollar company. This is not a big stream. But, you know, it's 6% up to 90,000 ounces, then 4%, 140, and then and then 3.5% uh, thereafter. So if you're an equity holder and you want your exposure to gold when you buy a project, you know, and then they're they're selling it at, um, at, 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 at a fixed cost, basically, to these people, you know, uh, that sort of reduces your, your leverage, let's say, uh, to the gold price. So I would assume Usually these 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 precious metal streams, the cost of capital of those can be anywhere from 10 to 15 percent, depending on the gold price assumption. So I would suspect that it's somewhere in there. Trilogy Metals is a world-class developer in Alaska's Ambler Mining District. The company already possesses 8 billion pounds of high-grade copper, 3 billion pounds of zinc, over 1 million gold equivalent ounces, and over 77 million pounds of cobalt. Trilogy's Arctic project boasts an after-tax net present value of $1.4 billion with a 33% internal rate of return. Trilogy is led by an experienced management team with proven success in discovering and developing projects in Alaska. The company is well capitalized has no debt, and possesses strong institutional support. Trilogy trades in New York and Toronto under the ticker TMQ. To learn more, go to TrilogyMetals.com. That's TrilogyMetals.com. And so you're not a favor of the streams. And I know uh, Rob McEwen also has been an outspoken uh, non-proponent of the streams as a way to finance mines into production. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, people do what they have to do, uh, you know, uh, and and these guys wanted to get the, the project into production. And maybe right now that wasn't available to them. Uh, the same sort of debt facility, like they, they did get a debt facility of 50 million, which is good, but they didn't get all debt. And so they had to raise more equity because they weren't in the same situation as Marathon because Marathon had a lot more working capital. As, as equity up front than, than Rio does. Rio doesn't have a lot of cash right now in terms of working capital. And so the bank would have looked at it and said, okay, where's your equity? Where are you? Rio could raise money potentially, but they would raise it at a big discount to where they're trading because it'd be a big whack of cash as opposed to doing a stream. And so maybe that you have to look at it. So what's the cost of the equity raising it uh, versus you know uh, the stream? And so that's probably the way they're looking at it. Joe, I'd like to get your take on a recent merger. This merger was announced just after our last interview, so I couldn't ask you then. Fortuna uh, b- buying Roxgold there in Africa. What's your take on this? I know a lot of Roxgold shareholders I talked to felt like they got the shorter end of the stick. Yeah, Roxgold is, is a great asset, high grade underground in Burkina Faso. And then they have a, uh, a development gold project in Cote d'Ivoire. And part of the reason that they got that uh, that they're working in Cote d'Ivoire is because the elevated uh, political risk, uh, you know, security risk, let's say, in Burkina Faso. Um, and so that's probably hurt its share price, you know, hampered its ability to grow, but it hasn't hampered results, like in terms of the grade that they're pulling, the growth, and, you know, the free cash flow. But, you know, they needed to diversify. But it's it's a lot of, like a lot of these companies, like let's say like Nevson, that had a great project, but it was an Eritrea, uh, you know, that they were generating free cash flow, but nobody cared because it was Eritrea. And so I think Rock's Gold was falling into that. So diversification that they couldn't do by themselves enough because their deposit, uh, Yaramoka, was such a big part of their valuation that they couldn't diversify it out significantly by being in Cote d'Ivoire. It really needed to be in a diversified portfolio. So acquisition was probably, you know, the end game for them. But I would think that a more, uh, you know, uh, a better suitor, uh, you know, would have been somebody already operating in Africa, sort of like your Endeavor Gold or something like that. Uh, Endeavor Mining, sorry. But Endeavor Mining just made the Taranga purchase. 
And so I'm sure they're still consolidating all of that. And so to make another purchase might not have made sense. And maybe they were weighing Rock School versus Taranga. And Taranga was a much bigger transformational purchase. So maybe they went that way. Fortuna, uh, you know, for your viewers, if they don't know, uh, you know, they have assets and I believe it's uh, Peru. And Argentina, the Lindero project is what they've just brought online. And so they're carrying their own bit of uh, geopolitical risk with, with their asset portfolio. And then they're introducing something in Burkina Faso, you know, but granted that's going to generate a, a lot of free cash flow for them. Uh, you know, logistically, it doesn't really make much sense because one's in the Americas and then they go all the way to, to Africa. So, uh, yeah, it, it was That's what B2 uh, Gold is doing now, though, right? Where they're going yeah. across the ocean as well. Oh, yeah. Well, B2 Gold, I mean, they went all the way to the Philippines, right? And and then they uh, came back to Africa with Focola. And now, but but they already had something in Namibia, you know, uh, and then they basically pulled out of Nicaragua. You know, so, yeah, you, you can make moves like this and maybe that's what they're thinking. It wouldn't have been the one that I would have said, okay, that's the one. But from what I understand that they have been doing due diligence on Rocks Gold uh, uh, for a while now in terms of looking looking to grow. So it's it, it's not unusual. And the other thing is that the African assets don't get the premium that some of these assets they might have been looking at in the Americas, like in the States or in Canada. And, and Rock School for the free cash flow it generates was probably uh, very inexpensive. Joe, I've been seeing some people post to avoid uh, South Africa as a mining jurisdiction because of the conflict and things becoming less favorable towards the miners in some opinions. Would you agree with that? What's your perspective on investing in South Africa? Yeah, I mean, um, when, when I was with Newmont, I mean, South Africa was just basically we were not going in there. And that was back in the 90s. You know, uh, I think Placer Dome at one point, um, Placer got into, um, I think it was uh, South Deeps or something like that in South Africa that I think they lost a lot of money on. So uh, South Africa has this infrastructure issues like power. It's got social issues that you have to deal with. Um, and, uh, it, you know, and, and if you follow the money of the big producers already in South Africa over the last few decades they've all been diversifying outside of south africa like you just saw was it last week uh, anglo gold acquiring corvus uh in in uh, in southwest nevada and the walker lane belt there uh, because they want to consolidate potentially a significant land package around their silicon project in the mother load area. So these guys are definitely looking to diversify not out of South Africa, maybe still stay in Africa, but definitely outside of South Africa. So for me, I had purchased a company with PGM exposure in uh, platinum group metal exposure in, in South Africa, but I was looking for a, uh, 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 a, a, an important event where they, where a big company would come in and uh, take ownership of the project and bring in capital and de-risk the technical risk as well as the financing risk. And this is, you know, to your point, when do you sell? So my investment thesis was that that didn't happen. So I sold because of the PGM, you know, or palladium uh, price, that stock still went up. But my thesis was the same is that I didn't want them to build it. I was hoping for this other company to build it. Uh, I, I like the deposit in that, but I didn't think that they could do it themselves. A couple interviews ago, you surprised me with your investment in Guatemala when I asked you for a stock pick. Do you want to, well, you didn't elaborate in that interview, but would you like to talk a little bit more about why you're willing to invest in Guatemala? Because from my perspective, I was uh, burned on the whole uh, Tahoe resources and yeah. Escobar mine. So I've never looked at Guatemala since then. Well, and probably understandably, you know, they've had a change in terms of government that's much more pro-business. And and also, you know, the constitutional court that basically suspended Escobar has changed as well. And now you're starting the talks to restart Escobar. You know, I'm not going to give a date as to when it's going to start. But in terms of companies to be involved in this process who have more, let's say, better ESG policies and understand, uh, you know, working with locals and that, I'd say Pan American is, is, is high up on that list. And so they're not talking up the potential to bring it up. They're just letting the process go. And, and now we're seeing meetings. We're seeing the first 
few meetings happening between them and the local Xinka uh, tribes to get this thing back uh, back up and running because it's huge for the Guatemalan government because obviously they've got those emigration issues. There's not a lot of employment and they can see what the impact of Escobar was on the economy prior. And so that restart is a huge background. And then you've got, uh, you know, Bluestone, uh, which is now, you know, uh, heavily invested by the Lundin Group. And now they've switched. And so that was an underground high grade project, about eight grams, you know, but a short mine life. And it didn't have a long, you know, a big production profile either. So speaking to the government, they said, well, you know, if you're interested and you can make this work and it, you know, fits through all the environmental hoops, you know, you can consider an open pit. And then they turned and said, yeah, an open pit makes more sense for the type of geometry, for the geometry of the low sulfidation upper thermal veins here. So we're going to propose an open pit, which is a completely reversal just because they're more positive on the government. And, you know, I bet against the Lundin group, probably in Argentina and also in Ecuador. And I don't know if I want to do that too many more times. And then just recently, Radius Gold and Volcanic Gold on their Holly Banderas project have, you know, put out some good holes. So, so if that environment changes, you know, there's not a lot of companies in there, you know, that can you can gain, gain exposure to. But there's definitely like, you know, like Ecuador, let's say, There's definitely a lot of prospectivity in 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 in, in Guatemala. Joe, I was presented with a pre-IPO um, private company in Pakistan, of all places, a jurisdiction of which I knew nothing besides what I researched on the internet. But when I considered it, I first said no, and then I just entertained it. And it was I was channeling you with the way you came to invest in Guatemala again to where, you know, on, at first glance, you would say no, but you would look deeper. And then in the case of Bluestone, you concluded, I will put my money there. How do you look at investments through the stands? You know, from a North American perspective, I think our hesitancy is there initially, but we would have to come overcome it through education. I mean, what's your yeah. take on the stand nations? Uh, I, I no, usually, because I mean, you, you get political risk, you get corruption, but then you also get security risk. And uh, so my idea of following the money is trying to see where are the big companies going and where are they leaving? And, you know, uh, you know, Sentara have had huge issues with their Kumtor uh, project in, in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, you know, so I, if I see big companies moving, to places and saying, oh, you know, this is a great project. I'm going to acquire this and I'm going to take a big land package. Then I'm interested. You know, if I see Rio Tinto saying, oh, I'm going to take a huge land package in Zambia. I see First Quantum operating there. I see, you know, the Copper Belt. I go, well, that 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 that's interesting. You know, you know, I, I could get in touch with that. You know, if I see the DRC, there's not a lot of operators, but you know, if there's people willing to go in, like Barrick uh, with Kabali, and then you got Ivanhoe there, then I go, okay, there are people willing to come in here and invest big. You know, if I don't see that, then I I, I sort of I'm reluctant to be the first mover. You know, in some of these places, just because it tends to be that the first mover gets the sharp end of the stick. And it's usually the people that wait back and wait to see what happens to see if anything changes. So for me, I, in terms of following the money, that's one one way I do it is by just seeing, uh, you know, monitoring what the bigger companies with more capital are thinking. Because in the end, they got to develop the project there. They're they're, they would be the buyer, host. right? Potential yeah. suitor. Uh Three months ago, we spoke. Uh, you last couple of times, you've given me some stock picks, or at least let me know of an investment you made. Any investment in the last three months that you'd be willing to share with my audience? Yeah, I guess you know on geopolitical risk and you know finding assets that work, but in in jurisdictions that you know people are interested in. Uh, like um, I, I bought shares in Azimuth, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, exploring a, a green fields, you know, grassroots exploration discovery called Patwan in, in northern Quebec. And what I like about it is that they're finding really thick intersections of decent grade there that look very good in terms of uh, cheap underground mining. And so they're drilling there. And that's one project uh, I'd gotten involved in. It's well capitalized. They've raised money. Uh, and I really like the management 
management team. And, and, and it's strange, but, you know, some of these companies that we talk about that have been, you know, around for decades, you know, they seem to be a lifestyle company, but these guys, you know, have maintained a really good share structure over that entire term and, uh, you know, have raised money intelligently. And now that they found something, you know, they're raising capital to actually play it out. But again, this is green fields, grassroots sort of stuff. So the, yeah, that, that sort of stuff still interests me. And some of that stuff, you know, like we were just talking about off air can be commodity agnostic, whatever's happening in the market. If you get the results, you know, people are still interested. But like we were saying that when they have to come back to the market is the interest there. Excellent. Well, Joe's website is explorationinsights.com. If you're a speculator in the mining sector, I'd encourage you to go over there both for the educational articles that he provides for free and as well as to look into the subscription that he offers. He offers very in-depth, knowledgeable analysis of what's going on, like what you heard here today. So, Joe, thanks for coming on the show, and we'll be touching base with you in about three months. All right. Thanks a lot, Bill. Maybe we'll see you down at Precious Metal Summit. Sounds great. All right. Cheers. Cheers.